I'm honored to be here today with Robert Smith, the founder, chairman, and CEO of Vista Equity Partners. Robert was recently named that by time as one of the world's 100 most influential people. Um, Robert's firm, Vista Equity Partners, manages over 58 billion with a portfolio that consists of more than 60 of the world's top software companies. He's a social activist, a philanthropist, who has invested his time and his money in young people, in underserved communities, and lifting up Black Americans. Robert, it's great to be with you today. It's always good to see you and to be with you, Bill. Now, I know there are a lot of demands on your time, and so I want to thank you for joining me for this conversation. You know, it seems like an important but awkward question these days with all that's going on in the world, but how are you? <laughs> uh, I'm doing well. I think, like all of us, uh, we have become hyper-productive individuals uh, because we aren't traveling as much, so we have access to each other through these, you know, digital platforms on the one hand, uh, and then on the other hand, we're seeing uh, a little more what I'll call fatigue. Um, because we're not getting the, the movement and the motion and probably not as much outdoor uh, uh, exposure. But uh, I'm doing well. My teams are doing well. We are, uh, I said, striving and moving forward. And, and frankly, we've had an ability to take on uh, a few other initiatives um, that uh, I think are frankly going to put us all into a, a better state of equilibrium as a society. So I'm excited about uh, what, what, what the future brings with leveraging our people and our technology. But thank you for asking. Well, I hope as you travel and are doing all this great work, uh, glad to see you're safe and your colleagues and family are safe. And um, maybe we can hear a little bit more about what you're working on as we talk. Sure. Yeah, um, good. I, I like to jump in. I've had the privilege of working alongside you over the past few months and was really inspired by the 2% solution. Uh, mm -hmm. The idea that the best way to begin to reverse corporate America's history of structural racism is for large companies for big banks to invest 2% of their annual net income over the next 10 years in ways that empower minority communities. Mm -hmm. I really want to thank you for that bold challenge. And I'd like to get you a sense from you of how this plan has been received so far. And, and, and yeah, just, let's just start there. I'd, I'd, I'd be sure. curious to see how much traction it's been getting. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, when I first introduced this idea, you know, the thought, and when you and I were working on, you know, the, the PPP activity, and I really started to understand through your eyes and through other managers of our CDFIs and MDIs, um, you know, our, call it our capillary banking system, the real challenges uh, that you all face. And a big part of the challenge is the undercapitalization on the one hand, and the lack of modernization of the technologies to deliver uh, comprehensive lending solutions, credit solutions, uh, you know, loan management solutions to the communities that you serve. And those are very vital communities and, uh, and frankly, just undercapitalized. And, you know, in, in recognizing that, and as you and I and others spent time kind of thinking about it, I said, look, a couple things we need. First, we need capital delivered into, into, the, into this capillary banking system, point one. Second, we need to modernize. And so bringing forward the idea because I get to work in the intersection of, of, of technology and, and finance, they said, well, why can't companies really bring forward a capital uh, and be, you know, uh, wherewithal? And we've been using some of our companies in the wherewithal to, to, to modernize this infrastructure. And we said, okay, well, now how do we get capital? And when I started looking at the, the, the very large banks uh, and the amount of profits they made over the last 10 years, I said, man, if they dedicated 2% of their annual net income, uh, to these, you know, CDFIs and MDIs and driving capital and credit solutions uh, into the communities, it would eliminate, I'll call it, a lot of the, the, the access to capital gaps, which ultimately creates safer communities, creates communities that are more robust, and ultimately eliminates a lot of the, you know, the, the, you know, the disparities of first income and wealth in these communities. And I think that would drive economic activity now forward. Um, you know, pretty substantially. In fact, uh, we partnered with, you know, McKinsey and, and uh, some of Eric Schmidt's folks and some folks at, you know, Adele and Microsoft and others. And as we got the work done, and actually BCG is doing some other work on this, as we started getting this work done, what we realized is if you actually, of course, eliminate this wealth disparity, you uh, create about, you know, one and a half to $2 trillion of GDP. So now the question is, how do you get that capital 
into the community. So um, one of my good friends, um, John Newton-Dahl, was working with one of his, his partners at Bank of America, uh, Ann Finucane, and they came up with an idea, and, it's, and they just got it done. It's called the you know, Equity Progress Sustainability Bond. This is a $2 billion bond. It was two and a half times oversubscribed. And in essence, it's the first social inclusion uh, bond by a bank. They issue $2 billion, and in essence, it can be used for you know, affordable housing, low-income tax credits, you know, financing supply chains, and putting in tier one, tier two capital into MBIs and, and grants and funding for uh, CDFIs, et cetera. So now they've done the first one, they're lining up a number of uh, Fortune 500 companies to issue similar bonds uh, to do the exact same thing. So, you know, it started off as an idea of, okay, well, net income, you can actually finance it using these bond structures, which are clearly being, or which are clearly in demand based on how the commitments were subscribed to. Uh, and I'm actually quite excited about that because now there's a financing vehicle that we can use uh, to, you know, to, to, to really support this 2% initiative. That's, that's really encouraging. And it's, it's an indication that we're actually seeing companies start to push the envelope a bit because while there's been a spattering of investment over the years in underserved communities, uh, you see the, 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 the numbers don't change dramatically. We're, we're not closing the gap. It's right. really gonna take a step further than we've seen historic uh, movement to actually um, overcome centuries mm -hmm. of underinvestment in communities right. of color. Right. And as you and I have talked, Bill, one of the most important thing is to put sustained levels of investment right. into the communities uh, across you know, multiple dimensions, as opposed to a one-time shot of, oh, here's a grant one time. Right. You can issue these bonds literally every six months, and there's a return to the investors. Um, what Bank of America did in this case was they actually got minority banks to do the underwriting and the agent. So there's money that went into those, those institutions. Uh, and now you can actually sustain uh, capital infusion into the areas that most need, you know, education, welfare, health, um, you know, trying to, you know, eliminating some of the, 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 the capital deserts that, that truly exist in our communities. So it's, I, I think about it as a very elegant solution to solving this problem and you can do it for long periods of time, not just a one-time shot. And I think that's what the key is. Well, you, you mentioned earlier the role, the work we did with the Paycheck Protection Program and the important role that, uh, as you so, I think, aptly termed capillary banking, um, the, the capillary banking system in closing these gaps. I'd be interested to get your perspective on how the initiative that Bank of America has, um, has, has launched um, can connect with those frontline first responder institutions that are more present in these communities because as we know, you know, banks control the vast level of resources that can help promote wealth, but they are not, they don't have a great history of actually connecting those resources in communities of color in underserved high poverty places. So right. uh, I, I, would, I would think that they, we hope we can make the linkage with CDFIs, minority depositories, as, as you've been working to strengthen that capillary banking system. Yeah, and I am seeing what I'll call the connective tissue form uh, and now being strengthened. Um, for instance, you know, out of this work, uh, the Business Roundtable uh, convened a group to, to focus on a number of areas. And one of the areas uh, that I got to co-lead with Jamie Diamond was focused on uh, finance, our finance subcommittee. And out of that, we said, okay, well, what are the things we need to do to enable this capital banking just to be more effective? And what's come out of that is actually pretty, pretty impressive. First thing is a, a, an investment and provide technical assistance uh, to, you know, black owned and run and uh, Latinx uh, uh, own and run businesses. How do you now start to, to you know, drive ongoing mentorship support and we're working on uh, with, and I've got a, a group working with uh, Satya and his team at Microsoft on, I'll call it business in a box. And, you know, the folks at, at, at PayPal and Square and others are saying, okay, well, how do we deliver, you know, technology solutions for the 50,000 plus 
Black and Latino small business owners, and that's our goal, 50,000 by 2025, that are enabling um, technologies, which create most, well, you know, the, the, you know, the, the average ROI, return on investment of, of, of technology in the small, medium business is over 900%. So it's probably one of the best investments you can make. So that's kind of one. Um, two, you know, we've made a goal to provide grants and low-cost debt to community development financial institutions, CDFIs, like you run, uh, and we've set a goal of investing a billion dollars by 2025 and to invest in tier one and two tier, tier two capital and deposits of 600 million by 2025. So these are all, you know, the BRT financial institutions, largest financial institutions in the U.S. And then support pilot plans or programs to modernize uh, the systems and infrastructure of the NDIs and CDFI. So we've got a number of companies who are coming up with, the, I call it the lender in a box solutions to deliver the modernization capability so that you have the ability to deliver um, to your, well, us to the MDIs, CDFIs, technical solutions, which can decrease the processing cost. And you know this, I mean, without, it takes about seven and a half to eight hours without technology to really process loans effectively. And when you implement these solutions, I mean, you can do these things literally as you build your infrastructure in, you know, minutes or hours. And, you know, cost is, is reduced quite dramatically and you can, with more capital, with more modernization, you can make a more efficient lending um, infrastructure, which will again, drive massive income and then wealth uh, creation and opportunity in these communities. And I think that's what's sustainable. And so you've got not just uh, large banks, but the business round table with the technical folks and technical companies all focused on these sort of solutions. And now the, the next piece of course is how do we start to drive uh, more policy um, decisions to, to start to support this more effectively. And so we're of course continuing to work with the administration and congressmen and, and women and uh, uh, to support those efforts as well. You know, Robert, every time I speak to you, while you clearly had incredible success as an investor, it's clear your, your, your training as an engineer is <laughs> yeah. a lot it's of little too, little too F obvious, huh? <laughs> no, no, you take a very systems approach. You dissect these challenges and then rebuild them. And when you talk about the CDFI sector, I think it's really important and you bring a, a great perspective to this conversation because often you, conversations around CDFIs and MDIs, particularly those in places like the ones I serve. I work in the Mississippi Delta, the Black Belt of Alabama, some of the poorest places in the nation. And there's a narrative around lack of capacity. Well, mm -hmm. it's a lack of investment. And as, as you've seen, as we've seen, um, when you make the strategic investments, uh, whether it's technology or and capital, because you need both, um, you can you, you get incredible results. My organization went from making 40 to 50 business loans in a year to within six months processing 7,400 PPP right. loans, closing 3,000. And it, you know, it, it, but it took the strategic technology investments as well as the capital. And, right. and so that, that's, I really appreciate you bringing that perspective to- Sure, now you think about, you take that, you know, you take your numbers, 50 to, you know, 7,500 or 17,000, you start thinking about scaling that across all the CDFIs and MDIs. And building that capacity and then driving capital through, you know, this channel. And, and you, you and I know this, when you, you know, we've got you know, 1.4 million small businesses as customers across our portfolio. When you enable those small businesses to be more effective, they hire more people, they stabilize neighborhoods, they put more tax revenues back into those communities and those communities self-heal. And I think that's how we should think about it. So it's just, it's, it's great to hear, you know, from where we were six, eight months ago to where we are today with, with, with your group. It's great. Well, I think we're on the right path. Um, you, you talk about the impact in communities on, on families, on children. Um, and I know that's been a big part of your uh, life's work. Um, I've heard you talk about the importance of your high school internship experience mm -hmm. at Bell Labs and how how that influenced your career path and ultimately got you where you are today. Can you talk a little bit about why these opportunities, why internships um, are so essential 
to creating a high qualified, diverse pipeline of talent? Sure. You know, it, where, where I grew up in, in Denver, uh, Colorado, was that I grew up at a time when computers were just getting introduced into the schools. Um, and today, you know, when you think about it, we have computer capacity uh, that's really available everywhere. Uh, the question is, do, do kids have access to it? And so, you know, we're working on solutions. Um, we've got some partnerships that are, that are becoming quite effective, actually, with the BRT and others to say, okay, how do we actually deliver, you know, through these bonds, for instance, the last mile uh, gap for students to gain access to computing capabilities. Um, we have to, as a country, unleash the capacity of our people. We have to unleash the, 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 the capacity of our young people. Um, and the best way to do that is give them, give them access uh, to computing power point number one and then instruction point number two. And then the third thing, which is really the overlay of that is mentorship. You know, I had a great experience working at Bell Laboratories when I was 17 years old and I had a mentor who was in his 60s. Um, and the relationship of having a very senior person with experience uh, and an interest and a desire uh, to, to, you know, you know, to think about, you know, give forward uh, knowledge, information um, is critical. And I, I, credit him in particular with helping me discover the joy of figuring things out, um, which is, again, one of the things that I embrace as one of the tenets of, uh, you know, a, a life well lived is enjoying, you know, solving complex problems in that context. And I think what we've been focused on now, we built a platform into our next platform. We've got 12,000 or so African-American students uh, and Latinx students. And it's, you know, of course, because of the way it's built, we can kind of have hundreds of thousands. Uh, and then partnering those with companies. Um, and beyond just, okay, here are some students you can choose from, you actually have to, as a, as a company, you know, go through modules of training and how to become a good mentor and how to become a good supervisor for these, for these, these students, especially in, in, in today's time where we have uh, distance internships. Um, and then the students that we have, I think now 65 modules, learning modules for those students to go through. Some are very technical. Uh, and some are actually a little more EQ oriented uh, around how to engage in an environment that you're, you know, not familiar with. And it kind of gets back to your, you know, the other part of your question, which was, you know, I grew up in a, like I said, a neighborhood. My parents were teachers and we had no real engineers in our community. So what does an engineer do? And it wasn't until I actually got a chance to see what an engineer does uh, that it made me excited to pursue that as a career. And I think it's important that we provide access and exposure, but not just, you know, I, don't get me wrong, I think a one day visit to a company is, oh, but, but, but sustainable engagement, which is an easy thing to do in this digital world where we engage today uh, to give those kids a chance to ask the questions and hopefully just, you know, discover the joy of figuring things out. Oh, really appreciate how you have paid it forward. And is, as you said, in addition to the exposure, there are real financial constraints that um, limit opportunity for communities of color, particularly our children. And you, as we've seen the enormous amount of debt on mm -hmm. families, particularly in minority communities, uh, rise. I uh, like your thoughts on what what can be done in terms of helping students overcome these that the, 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 these obstacles. You know, you've you've made investments in HBCUs. I'm I'm trying to find the Robert Smith for Mississippi Valley and Alcorn and Tougaloo here in our region. But you clearly have zeroed in on this as an important issue. But what what are your thoughts about what can be done in terms of helping students at HBCUs uh, sure. address student debt? Sure, and this, you know, a lot of this came out of, um, you know, as I made the gift uh, at Morehouse and, and really realizing, you know, the, the challenge that a lot of our students have, A, they come out of school with a little more debt, about $7,500 more, and then unfortunately, um, because of the, you know, income gap and wealth gap, i.e. their parents typically don't have assets, houses, or, or financial assets that they can pay college, these kids into borrowing more and having more to pay back, uh, you know, five and eight and 10 years later. 
uh, and it's debilitating. And the most shocking statistic that we learned in this work is over 60% of African American wealth goes towards servicing student debt, student loan debt, and which is just appalling. And when you think about it, most of that capital goes for the most part back to the federal government because a lot of them are federal loans, you know, pair plus loans, et cetera. And African-Americans traditionally haven't participated in some of the other wealth acquiring mechanisms that the federal government has provided over time, you know, Homestead Act, Southern Homestead Act, GI Bill, those sort of things. And so they don't have the gener generational wealth to, to support uh, that next generation of, of in, in engaging in, you know, the uplift. And most people know that, you know, a college education has traditionally been the biggest uh, you know, uplift uh, from a wealth perspective in America. But if you're burdened with this debt, it's just almost impossible to overcome in a reasonable period of time. So what we've now done is we launched about a month ago a thing called um, SFI Student Freedom Initiative. We're doing our first launch with 11 HBCUs. We funded it with a Fund2 Foundation of $50 million. Um, and in essence, what we're able to do is take, and it's the whole idea of paying it forward, take this capital, students can borrow it, it's a lower price than parent plus loans, but they don't pay it back to, you know, the government or an institution, they pay it back into the fund. And if you go and you work at, you know, a tech company or financial institution, whatever, you're making more money, you pay back a little faster, a little bit more. And if you go teach at a school in your community, uh, you pay back a, a lot less for, for a lot longer, but it fuels the system that then gets to fund the next generations of kids. So now with that initial funding, we will be able to graduate STEM students out of those 11 HBCUs in perpetuity, which is phenomenal. And as we raise the additional $450 million, we'll be able to support all STEM students out of all HBCUs in perpetuity. And I think that is, again, a unique solution. Uh, like I said, we've launched it. Um, and I'm excited about that because it gives these kids, these students who become adults, a chance to actually build wealth, uh, well, get a college education, not have the, the burdensome debt. They will have debt, but not so burdensome that they can't build wealth. And it gives them some flexibility to not just go work at a job that pays a salary, but potentially go and become a teacher and drive that you know, STEM education back into the communities very directly. So that's why I'm, I'm excited about what this, what this initiative is. Oh, that's, that's really exciting. And I'm, I'm, I, those numbers are encouraging, um, particularly as we see the country becoming more black and brown. Mm -hmm. uh, we cannot afford to leave so many assets underdeveloped. And I think that's what we've done to often with our children, particularly children right. of color. Um, which takes me to your, um, the work you're doing at the Business, right, the business Roundtable. Mm -hmm. um, really encouraged by the um, restated purpose of a corporation, an economy that works for all Americans. I uh, think that's important. And as you work with this group of CEOs to promote a thriving economy, and expand that opportunity. I know that you have been uh, leading in efforts around this racial equity agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, can you share some of what, uh, how that's developing and how it addresses racial disparities under the leadership of the business sector? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. So uh, Doug McMillan over at, at uh, Walmart, um, kind of the heels of the George Floyd murder said, listen, we need to understand what is going on and do something about it. So he formed a series of subcommittees. One is I'll call the Equitable Justice Subcommittee. Originally, um, Randall Stevenson was, was chairing that. Now we have Craig Arnold, uh, who's at Eaton Corporation, chairing that group. Um, we have the Health Subcommittee, uh, Arnie Sorensen, who runs Marriott. Um, was, is, is chairing that group, uh, Jamie Dimon uh, and, and me on the finance committee. Um, and then we have uh, Mary Barr, of course, from General Motors, who's uh, education and workforce subcommittee. And there's two big categories that we focused on. So when each of them, I'm actually just formed a broadband committee because it's cutting across all of them. 
One is what can we do as corporate leaders that have access to the assets of the corporation? You know, people hiring, training, um, et cetera. And then the other piece is what can we support from a policy perspective uh, to advance, you know, racial equity, um, social justice, et cetera, uh, economic justice. And so we've actually just finished the reports from each of these subcommittees. And I think there's easily over 150 CEOs that got involved in this. Um, and like I said, with real tangible goals for things that we can do, and then tangible object objectives in terms of things that we can support uh, as it relates to pushing forward through the government, you know, what are the steps the government can take and how can we encourage them uh, to take these steps? And so, you know, I would encourage everyone to get a copy of this report and Bill, I'll get a copy to you because again, it points to some very specific things that we can do as companies and also initiatives that the government through our support, um, irrespective of, you know, where you might sit politically, it just makes sense for our citizenry uh, to be the most effective citizenry. And like we talked about, if you really eliminate the wealth disparity in this country, not only does it expand our GDP by up to, you know, 7% uh, per year. But it also, you know, there's studies, plenty of studies that show that, you know, when you actually have communities uh, that have a, uh, ec that are economically viable, they are safer communities. Mm -hmm. And when they're safer communities, uh, you have the ability to support more wholesome lifestyles um, across the board. So we're, you know, we can eliminate, you know, these capital deserts, these education deserts, healthcare deserts, food deserts, through these sort of initiatives. And I think it's, it's incumbent upon the large corporations, which I'm so proud and pleased uh, that the BRT has adopted this as uh, an area that we're going to put true attention and focus on. And then, you know, in addition to the things we're, we're focused on as it relates to, um, I'll call it climate change, um, because I think we have to do that all in the construct of you know, of, of preserving our, our planet and, you know, the home in which we all live in. Well, this is, this is great. I would love to continue this conversation um, for hours, but I know yeah, we're- no, gonna, but Maybe not here. <laughs> we, we will we'll take it offline, but I, I really, what you said really connects with me. We were started here at Hope uh, by Rob Walton, who, Sam Walton's son, who recognized that his interests align with the faith of the people in the communities that, where they live and work and where they rely on to buy mm -hmm. their products. And I think that alignment between our interests is the only way that we can really get through and, and, and these challenges and get, and, get and get collective action at right. the level that's needed. And, and so I, I really love your perspective as we wrap down. Um, um, are you optimistic? Do you see um, the corporate community using their position to, as you said, influence policy, but also their own practices to close these gaps in a way that will actually uh, get us to that more perfect union? So when I think about it, am I optimistic? Generally, yes. You know, I see the work that's happening at the BRT and I'm, I'm optimistic about that. There, you know, uh, uh, I don't know if you know Treasurer Wooden at, in, in the state of Connecticut, he has convened a group of investors and these are largest investors in the world. These are, you know, uh, public market investors, you know, from the Black Rocks, Alliance Bernstein, all those sort, of, those sort of firms. And he has challenged them along the same lines and saying, you bring your heft and your power as investors to these corporations and say, here's what we want from you. You know, I like the way he thinks about it. There's a mirror in the window. Okay, the first thing in the mirror, what are you doing internally promoting uh, equitable opportunities within the corporations in which you run? And then what are you doing through the window in supporting as an investor initiatives that you know make sense for the corporations that you are the shareholders of? Mm -hmm. And when I think about the corporations, when I think about the shareholders, I think about the employees that make up the community. And I think about the broader community of teachers and you know, firefighters and, and uh, healthcare workers, uh, police officers, et cetera. And then you have government. This is the first time I've heard all of those constituencies really start to say, we need to make a change. In some cases you would see groups 
say we need to make a change and others would say, I understand, but I have a priority that I need to go deal with. Yep. This is the first time I'm hearing the priorities being aligned across all of those groups. And that's what gives me optimism. That's what gives me hope. Well, Robert, what, um, what would you say to these thousands of investors um, who are watching this conversation today? What is the challenge? What is something you would charge them to do to yeah. use their position to make a difference? Yeah, I think first, you know, look in the mirror and say, what can I do with things that I can control? Hiring, training, promotion, implicit bias, I eliminate all of that in my organization as best I can. But don't wait to just do that. Look through the window and say, here are the organizations that are being effective. BRT is a good place to start because we're pointing to, okay, here's, you want to get involved in fair housing, you know nothing about it, here are organizations that can help. You want to get involved in, you know, student freedom, freedom initiative, here's an organization that can do it. Um, so, you know, then be very conscious and look out the window and look at organizations that are doing things and invest in them. You know, we, we pulled together, for instance, a list of 13,000 school districts and what students don't have access to broadband. Well, I'm happy to give you the list and then you can look in your community and say, well, you know what? These students may not have broadband or they may have broadband and don't have a device. Let me get involved. And Michael Dell's got his team involved on that for community. So people are actually saying, what can I do to help? You know, Satya got his team involved in Michael. Well, how do we deliver surfaces at a low cost to these communities? We're delivering the learning management systems through our company. I think that's, look for those companies, those groups, those organizations, those institutions that already have the elegant solutions outlined and put heft behind them, put capital behind them, put time and resources. I tell my teams all the time, we can always write checks, but often it's your, our organizational capacity and writing checks that makes a sustainable difference. Um, and I think that's what we're seeing is a lot of brilliant people focused on bringing a new set of organizational capacity to find the right new equilibrium of, of inclusion in our, in our economy. It's a great charge to end on. Thank you, Robert, for making time to be with us today. Always a pleasure, Bill. It's so good to see you. You take care, and I'll probably be talking to you very soon on something else. <laughs> Sounds great. Be well. Great. Thanks, my friend.